Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, look, the best thing about those brothers is that they love her very deeply, um, and and in spite of moves made or arguments had over the years about her being a vampire or, you know, or their point of view on it, they both know that that's the one thing that she never wanted, that it's a girl who loves her family so deeply and loves so deeply, like she, if anybody deserves a human life and to grow up with the babies, like she said in the in season two, and, and if anyone deserves it, it's her, and she, that's just been taken away from her, and so I think in a weird way, she's going to be a little bit more pragmatic about it than they are, because I think that... I think that they're both going to be very set on how will she get through this and how can we save her from herself. And both of them have very different experiences as vampires, as you guys know. And um, it's not going to put them on the same page. They're not going to be on the same page at all in the beginning. And and that's one of the tragedies of a later becoming a vampire is that it, t- it took the brothers who are on this really beautiful, beautiful path finding their way back to each other. And they finally, like, really said, you know, bros before hoes, basically, <laughs> to paraphrase, and 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 now we're going to see that tested a little bit. Because Elena obviously doesn't want to be a vampire, is she going to seek out something that might actually turn her back on well, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the first episode is very much about we have got to exhaust every single possible opportunity and dig deep into every old grimoire and, you know, and do anything we can. And the, the outcome of that will set the stage for, you know, for what happens moving forward. And, you know, as we know, there's, you know, if there was any kind of way to get out of being a vampire, I think that somebody would have would have brought it up or wanted it or had it, so we'll see. Um, speaking of Elena, she's probably going to be struggling with being a vampire. Is Jeremy safe with her, or could they possibly move into the Salvatore? That he's not by himself, you know, alone with and he's fledging a vampire. You know, I think that, um, I think that that's definitely a concern, it's, you know, that shacking up with, a, you know, a potential vampire who may or may not be able to control her, her urges it could be difficult, but and we don't have any plans to move them out of that house. And I feel like that house represents uh, family and a neighborhood and Mystic Falls in a way, um, and, and the Gilbert family in a way that we're not ready to just say goodbye to yet. How is Matt going to react? He's the only normal one. So how how has this changed the dynamic of Matt with everybody else now? Well, what's funny is Matt, Matt was always the ordinary guy and now in his ordinariness that's a word uh, he has by default become extraordinary so in his own way him being the only normal one is has become very unique and very special and and I think he's going to start to feel the burden and the pressure of you know of how can I find my way within, in, in this world and how can I earn my life that she saved for me and um and how can I become a superhero in my heart, you know, and within my actions, and, and even if I don't have the power to, to do anything about it. You said that, you know, we didn't see Joseph Gordon's body <laughs> uh, alive. So, I mean, obviously, Klaus is going to play a role in this season with Tyler, so what can we do? You can expect Klaus to play a role in this season with Tyler. No, Joseph, Joseph will be back. Um, and Klaus will be back. And, uh, Joseph asked Klaus will be back um, sooner than later. <laughs> Do you have any sort of long-term goals for how long you want the series to last? Where you want it to go to, or is it sort of? Are you keeping it open? Well, <laughs> funnily enough, it's it's this great myth that um, that TV writers have any control whatsoever <laughs> over how long their show goes or doesn't go. You know, I think we all, when you get to season four. You, you're pretty sure there's going to be a season five, and and because of the way you know the business works, you, odds are good there's a season six. Um, the end of six is when everything could change. That's when actors, you know, contracts come up. That's when things shift. The show gets more expensive. That's when people start making those decisions. So we always have looked at it like a six-year show. Um, we have very little control over whether it goes on and on and on. Um, and I think what you do is you 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 protect the longevity of storytelling without without spinning your wheels. And we don't we don't do that. We don't like to do that. So um, I look at it as you know. 
at the end of season six, it'll be like, here's what we meant to do. <laughs> and then and then we'll see what, what happens from there. Do you forecast from now, major, anything that you're going to kind of pull the rug under our feet, so to speak, with any really big changes or like new characters that are going to be out that we can expect to see that it is going to be shocking to the well, hopefully everything that we do is a surprise in some way. Um, I think that uh, I think that this year, you know, uh, this year we definitely have some some good and interesting surprises built in, especially as we get to the end of the season. Um, some the definite things that when I talk about it to people, um, to my you know to Kevin or to the studio or the network, and they go, oh, whoa, you know, and you always are happy when you get that reaction. Um, there's gonna there, there's gonna be a lot of intense moves this year, and uh, in the same way that we weren't really afraid to like go balls out, excuse my language, with Stefan as the Ripper, um, we're not really afraid to to take chances and take risks on Elena's journey and with everyone, especially thematically, as everybody's like figuring out who they are and who they're meant to be as they approach graduation and making decisions about what their life is gonna be as they move forward. What's Bonnie's journey going to be like? She gets a little dark. Yeah, well, Bonnie, I mean, look, so for Bonnie to do what she did at the end of the season, that tapped into some serious dark places, and she's going to learn very quickly that, that those dark places are easy to tap into and and not so good to tap into. And um, Bonnie's going to be, Bonnie's going to have a really rough journey, um, but it, I, hopefully a really beautiful journey, because I think that... Um, She's kind of, through circumstance, ended up on her own. Her, she lost her grandmother, who could have been a mentor to her. You know, she uh, she doesn't really have someone to look to and say, "Hey, can you help me be this or help me learn this?" And and I, I would like to introduce somebody this year who who can be a little bit of a of a guardian and guidance in the in the witch world to Bonnie to kind of help her understand the extent of her power and all the consequences that come attached to it. Yeah, we brought in a new a new character called Connor who will who will meet early on and uh, he's gonna be played by the actor Todd Williams. Um, and he, you know, he just shows up kind of kicking ass and taking names and where he's different than you know hunter land that we've dabbled in the past is he doesn't seem to be in it necessarily to protect the secret or to cover up the you know the the town from knowing he's more like you know shoot first ask questions later and uh, he's pretty hardcore, and he's and he takes a lot of our characters by surprise in just how hardcore he really is. Do you plan to expand on Jeremy's power any further in this season? Well, Jeremy, and which power? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, t- truth be told, we're. Uh, Yes, that's very much, that's his special skill, so to speak. I can put it on his college applications. Um, but, um, but really, it's going to be more about him, you know, especially with the new hunter coming to town, and Jeremy, who, who comes from a family of people who have committed themselves to being anti-vampire. You know, how can he play one side against the other? How can he protect his sister's secret and yet still, still learn... Uh, some tricks to the trade from this hunter, and so we'll be focusing on that more than we will be dabbling in the ghost world right off, mostly because that was our story for last year. Um, but his, his ability has not left us, it has not gone away, it's just, uh, it's just not his focus. Do you have a lot of um, on the set and off the set, any big pranksters, or any great pranksters? I'm not a prankster at all because I think pranks are terrible because I feel bad for the person that's getting pranked because it's basically predicated upon humiliating somebody. Um, that being said, in season one, in, in season one, and, and in season two, Marco Siega was like this diabolical, nasty, nasty prankster, and he got Matt Davis probably better than anybody has, and he got Michael Trevino, and he got Zach Rorig in ways that you just were like, oh, that's good, and that's so evil. Um, and then Nina tried to get him and had him, and, and had him so good. Uh, but then when he found out, he figured out that she was pranking him, so he turned the tables on her and mailed her to the wall. 
So I, unfortunately, I'd love to tell you the details, but they're very inappropriate. But, um, <laughs> but it was great. Julie, um, sorry, I'm back here. I'm like, oh, no, sorry, sorry. No, that's all right. Uh, you know, I, I follow your, uh, the feedback you get on Twitter all the time. Oh, yes. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> like leaves a loud imprint in, in our creative brains, you know, um, and then we have to work very hard as creative people to to fill that in and to smooth it out so that we can stay on the road. Whoa, I just like dug into some crazy metaphor. Um, it, it's difficult not to hear it because it's right there in front of you and it's very, very passionate. But you also have no idea where it's coming from. Is it coming from one person with 150 names? Is it coming from a 50-year-old, you know, a 12-year-old? Is it coming from one small faction of people? And so what I try to do is every time I find myself getting defensive or, or, um, or distracted by that, that passion, I, I'll go to my friends who watch the show, and I'll say, so what do you watch the show for? Why do you love the show? And they're like, it's just awesome. <laughs> and it's great stories. And I say, no, but really, I mean, do you, you know, do you love, oh, I love Damon. Damon's amazing. It's so great. Well, how do you feel? Well, stuff it. I love stuff it, you know? And that, it takes me back to what I was saying in the panel earlier. It's just that, like, I remember watching Love Triangles as a TV fan and kind of rooting for both sides. And, it, it, and, and, and so... Um, I think many people, not all, obviously, are like that, and so I try to I try to stay on their path, you know, and um, and tell the right stories for the characters and for the show. I mean, the show is a love triangle that is meant to run for a very long time. You know, it's not always going to be the driving force of the show, but it is the central premise: is two vampires in love with one girl move to a small town. You know, and that's our that's our show. We're, that's the Alcatraz of our Alcatraz, you know, uh, the island of our lost. So, it, you know, we've got to keep it alive and keep it honest and keep it, you know, fluid. And, and that's what we definitely have to do. And I don't think necessarily people who just want it to happen understand that necessarily that it's a long marathon, you know. Uh, yeah. time lapse uh, between this season it's uh, instant it's immediate yeah yeah well I, it's several hours later <laughs> yeah that's you guys thank you great questions really great questions